So now for the good stuff. I am thrilled to introduce our guest for today, playwright, author, and television writer, Itamar Moses. Itamar won the 2018 Tony Award for Best Book of a Musical with his musical co-written with David Yazbek, The Band's Visit. He is a graduate of Yale University and received his MFA in Dramatic Writing from New York University. He is also the author of the full-length plays Outrage, Bach at Leipzig, Celebrity Row, The Four of Us, Yellow Jackets, Back, 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 Completeness, and The Whistleblower. And the musicals, Nobody Loves You with Gabby Alter and Fortress of Solitude with Michael Friedman. Itamar's work has been seen all over the world and has won awards from the Portland, San Diego, Dallas, and Bay Area theater critic circles and been nominated for Drama Desk, Lucille Lortel, Outer Critic Circle, and Adelco Awards in New York. He's received new play commissions from the McCarter, Playwrights Horizons, Berkeley Rep, the Wilma Theater, South Coast Rep, Manhattan Theater Club, Lincoln Center, and the Goodman Theater. I hope one day we will add the Alliance Theater to that list. On television, Itamar has written for TNT's Men of a Certain Age, HBO's Boardwalk Empire, WGN's Outsiders, and Showtime's The Affair. Please help me welcome Itamar Moses. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I've appeared. I'm doing well. Yes, you did. Was it pretty easy? Yeah. Yeah. Pressing the link. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just realized oh, I'm, man, I'm happy to have you. Here. I'll turn it around. Well, what's on I your mind? You know, I've been mug. thinking. About what does your mug say? Oh, I was just noticing that it's a Huntington Theater mug, so I have to turn it around. That's okay. And it's an Alliance mug. I, I noticed on a call the other day, I, um, I have, we have some really crass mugs at my house for some reason, and I bring them all from home, and I collect them here, and I have my coffee out of them, right? And I was holding one of these mugs, and it had some pretty profane language on the front of it, and I thought, oh, geez, I hope we can edit that. And it's funny, because I'm actually not a cusser. But sometimes I like to play the part. Anyhow, Edamar, just a little bit behind you with the, the light. Can you perhaps, is it possible to turn your computer a little? Uh, yeah, actually, yes. Why not? I'm sorry <laughs> to bother you. Um, I, now there's a different light. Is that, that better? That's perfect. <laughs> okay. do, you feel, do you have all your props there? Do you feel comfortable? Yes. Yeah, I had, I, see, I had, I had tastefully arranged everything behind me to create the correct impression, but now it's all random, but that's all right. I, I think I like random. I actually like <laughs> wear clothes that are sort of an eyesore against this lovely piece of art behind me. I'm giving you a lot of patterns today. It's <laughs> called Pattern Wednesday. Um, I, I have told you this, I believe in an email. Or, or maybe it's what it's when you won the Tony, but but you know the band's visit, that that's actually a film that had been tossed to the Iraqa group or in Senate to us, and um, and man, I I looked at that movie and I thought some somebody's gonna do this, you know. I I knew the Atlantic was was interested. I don't know if it was in process yet, but um, and I was hoping it would be our company um, because when I watched that movie. Contrary to what I've heard a lot of folks ask you or speak to you about, when I watched it, I actually thought this is perfect for a musical because there's a lot that's left unsaid. Time is compressed, which I think is like great material when, when there's like a real beginning, middle and end that's already laid out in the film. Um, the conflict is so baked in. And when I heard that you were hired, I thought, well, there you go. That, that is to me perfection because your writing is so lean and it's muscular and it's to the point and it's, um, it says just enough, which is like really the job of, of the librettist, right? But I, but I am curious and you can be as honest as you want. I mean, we do eventually put these on our website, but for now it's just 
you, me, and these 30 fabulous people on this call. What were your first thoughts when you watched the um, movie? So I hadn't seen the movie in its, you know, initial sort of art house theatrical release, but I, I knew of it. But the first time I ever watched it was um, after a meeting with Orrin Wolf, the producer who had the rights to adapt it, and Hal Prince, who at the time was one of the producers and was uh, originally slated to direct it before he stepped away to, to, to do Prince of Broadway. But, um, and they gave me the DVD and they said, you know, watch this, we're thinking of adapting it, think, you know, tell us what you think. So the first time I watched it, it was with that specific question in mind, can this be a musical? Um, and I think what, it's, you're right that the question often comes up, like, well, it's so counterintuitive, or Yazbek and I will often say that, but I think what we mean is, it's counterintuitive from the perspective of what people ordinarily think should make a musical, um, because it's very quiet and it's very spare, and that's those aren't things people associate with musicals. Um, uh, I think incorrectly. I think musicals are, can be a very um, earnest and sentimental and bombastic form inherently, and that's why if you pick earnest and sentimental source material you can often end up with a musical that is like putting a hat on a hat. And so I think the things that, counterintuitively, the things that seem like they shouldn't be musicals for various conventional reasons, often end up being the best source material for musicals. Something that's kind of like dark or something that's, um, you know, sort of very ironic. There's all kinds of ways in. So in this case, the things that made it, um, uh, counterintuitive were what attracted me. I was like, oh, what's so interesting about this is that if you could make the musical feel like the movie, which is to say quiet and spare and really, really small in terms of how zoomed in you are in the intimate human moments, mm -hmm. it would be um, something really original because that's not usually what we see in commercial musical theater. Um, on top of which, there were a lot of obvious reasons that it could sing, which is the other question you need to ask when you're looking at source materials. Like why, because it's, what, the, that people break into song and musicals inherently makes no sense. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always an uphill battle. So you need some reason for that to happen. Um, and in this case, it's about musicians. There's a live band on stage, um, but on a deeper level, um, it's about people who don't share a common first language and, in, and they, they speak to each other in, in the broken English, which is the second language for both groups of people. And um, they bond over things that they do have in common, food and love and, and music. And so music is, yeah, and so music is almost a metaphor for a form of language that transcends speech, that transcends words. So on, on that level, what, what better source material could you have for a musical? So, so when I watched it, my thought honestly was, if someone lets the adapters do this right, it will be a great musical, but it's very ruinable if you tried to turn it into something more traditionally big uh, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, sweeping and whatever, and if you if if someone wanted you to really foreground the politics, the sort of Arab Israeli politics, yeah. which are inherent in the bones of the story, but but there isn't like some overt explicit political debate. And I was like, and if that's the other way to ruin it is to try to make it that, which would right. fight the material. So that was what I thought. I was like, someone could do this, but someone they would have to have the support of producers and institutions that wanted it to be tr truly a musical adaptation of the movie and not something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd never met Yazbek and our first conversation ever was a phone call about this show. And I thought to myself going to that call, I thought, I'm gonna tell, I'm just gonna say like, here's why to do it. We have to keep it small. We have to keep it intimate. The songs will be our, our replacement for what the camera can do in close up will drill down into these internal spaces inside the people, but it won't be about big production numbers. And, and if he disagrees, because I, I knew he was a genius, I, you know, I knew Full Monty, I knew Women on the Verge, I knew Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, but he'd never done something like that. You never met him. And I never met him. So I thought if he says, no, 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 that, that's, it can't, that's bad, that's not a musical. 
work, but he, he came into the conversation and said exactly the, all of the things that I was thinking. So it was like, okay, we're on the same page. And then we just kept lucking out. Like Oren turned out to be a very smart, creative producer who really encouraged us to keep true to that vision. And then we ended up with David Cromer, who is, um, who I know, ta I think talked to you on, in one of these previously. Yeah. And yeah, and Cromer is, if you want like small bore naturalism, you can hardly do better, you know? So, so everyone, yeah. like all the core people were on the same page and that, and that really helped. Right. And the, um, the actors speaking in Arabic and Hebrew, mm -hmm. like from, from the beginning, did you know you wanted to explore that? Or was that something that you found as you worked? It was one, I, I'm a, you know me a little bit, Amanda, and you know that I'm like a sucker for like a formal device or some sort of conceit or some sort of game that you're playing with the audience that has some sort of echo with the, with the content or what the thing's about. Like I always, that's always really attractive to me. And, and so I think early on watching the movie, I was, you know, the movie is in three languages. It's in Arabic, Hebrew, and English. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're watching it, you know, an American cut, the, the Hebrew and Arabic are subtitled. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't want people reading subtitles all night, but I also don't want to do something unrealistic where Israelis are speaking English amongst themselves and the Arabs right. are speaking English amongst themselves all the time in a way that they wouldn't be because that will shatter our sense of the reality. So I thought maybe, and it's always fun as a writer and helpful to have formal constraints to push against. Like, let me make a rule that is true to this world and see if I can play by that rule and what that forces me to do. So I thought if we don't use sub super titles and if we, uh, and if I try to keep as true as possible to the language people would really be using, mm -hmm. um, it'll create a situation where all the most important conversations and statements have to be cross cultural so that they, can, they will be in English. And that to write it in such a way that when people are speaking Hebrew or Arabic amongst themselves, um, we can get what matters about it from, from context. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, okay, that's the game I'm gonna try to play. And, you know, it, it went back and forth, even up through previews at the Atlantic, we were refining, like, there are moments where, that feel like cheats to me, but that we seem to get away with, you know, the, uh, where he re he's yelling at this guy and he really would be yelling in Arabic and then he switches to English because we want the audience to understand. Okay. So, the, so, you know, Shalhoub sort of justified it by, he glances back at the Israelis and, oh, it's become public and he wants them to know how he's, you know, right. like you find little ways of, but it was literally on the level of line by line, like nudging it back and forth. What's the least amount of English we can use and keep the audience with us? And it also led to this great discovery late in previews at the Atlantic where there's one part near the end where this Israeli is on the phone with his girlfriend far away. And he, what he says is very mundane and simple, but also beautiful. And I was like, there's no way he would say that in English. I, I refuse to translate that into English. He is, there's, it makes no sense. He would only be speaking in Hebrew. And, and then we realized, oh, well, we haven't used super titles all night. What if that's the one thing we project and translate? This very like mundane thing to his girlfriend where he says like, you know, I'm, I'm wearing this sweater you made me. It keeps me warm. Right. And that's the only, so like, oh, it turns out if we do that once really late, it's very beautiful. Yeah. And it's like one pattern break that it's the exception that proves the rule. So I, I began, yes, with that, let me tr commit to this rule. And then as those things often do, it led to, you know, discoveries of, of ways we could, the like creative discoveries we wouldn't have made if we just leaned on super time. I mean, I, I love hearing you talk about this because one of, one of the things I've always, as, as both an actor and now a producer, always questioned is just the use of accents in general, you know, mm. like you're doing a musical, you're doing cabaret and, and they have German accents and they, yeah. Yeah. well, they'd actually be speaking German. So <laughs> like I, I, I always like question is meeting it, is that meeting it halfway? Right. Is that more useful than actually forcing understanding on behalf of the audience's part by expression and following the physical production? Is that actually more helpful than, than what I think of as meeting halfway, which is this flavor of yeah. an accent because sometimes it's only a flavor because the accent isn't pure. Yeah, I feel, it's funny. I, I, think, I think you can do it any 
anything as long as the rule is internally consistent. Yeah. So yeah. to be honest, we I remember this is before we even did it at the Atlantic. We were doing all of these readings, these like one day readings around the table at the Atlantic, getting ready for the production. And we once tried a version where everything was in English, but we did a rule where they spoke in accented broken English when they spoke to each other. But then when the, the Israelis were spoke internally they spoke in unaccented English to indicate this is their native language and it kind of wasn't it made right. sense but it wasn't as fun because it, it turned out that the audience or most of the audience being shut out of like half the dialogue was part of the experience yeah. because it put them in the position of the Egyptians who can't understand when the Israelis speak Hebrew and the Israelis who can't understand when the Egyptians speak Arabic, although, especially once we were on Broadway, there would always be a smattering of Arab speakers and Hebrew speakers in every audience. Yeah. Who, and you could always tell because they were things that this one pocket of people would laugh at. Right. That no exactly laughing. Exactly. Yeah. Usually, usually the, the filthiest swear words in the show <laughs> are all in Hebrew and Arabic. <laughs> now, were the, um, you know, I know it's different with every project, but I, I'm curious, were the film producers, the folks who created the film, how involved were they? So the, the film is really the baby and the brainchild of one person, the um, Ron Kolarin, who's this wonderful Israeli filmmaker. Um, and he, he was involved the perfect amount. He, you know, he basically, once he granted Oren the rights, he was sort of like, do what you want. And he had, he'd worked on the film for something like 10 years uh -huh. and he had all of these drafts. And so through Oren, he gave me not just the movie itself, but the all of the drafts of the screenplay he'd worked on. Um, so there were all these ideas he didn't use or hadn't fully executed that like I was able to think about because I expanded a lot of things and it was nice to know um, what his impulses had been about other ways things might go. Um, uh, and so he, he gave me this great treasure trove uh, to start with. And then, you know, uh, he would read drafts of the script, not every draft, but every now and then and send a couple of notes. One of my favorite things in the final script that's not in the movie is right from one of his emails where he told, I, you know, I was writing it in the, in the movie where Simone, the, the assistant conductor of the band and clarinetist, um, talks with the Israelis about his unfinished concerto that he's been unable to write. And in the movie, he just plays it for them and that's the entire scene. And in the show, we have him play it and then they, everyone talks for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was writing that scene and, and I was struggling with it. And Iran told me this weird story about, uh, which I think might even be from his wife, which is about um, her missing her own birthday party, hiding up in a tree. And I was like, that's amazing. That's, that's a beautiful story. You're right, that fits perfectly. And, and I gave it to Itzik, the, um, the Israeli guy who's hosting the clarinetist, he tells this, this, and it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's this beautiful anecdote about, you know, not wanting to end the middle part of something and get to the end of it because you're afraid of endings. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, just came out of this email exchange with Iran. So, so that was how he was involved. And then he, but he was never, and we, and Yasbek and I were very invested in pleasing him. We were super nervous when he came for the first time to see it at the Atlantic, which was around when we opened. And when he liked it, we were like enormously relieved, but he was never, um, you know, creatively he was on, he was two or three films down the road at that point. Yeah. And he just, I think he just wanted us not to, to damage it, but he was happy for us to do. Uh, that, our that's thing. the most perfect arrangement. Yeah, it was pretty great. Going in. Yeah. Um, so switching to another musical, I, I have always thought that this would be so hard. Well, I'm also not a writer, so it would be very hard for me. I'm thinking about Fortress of Solitude. I loved that book. Mm. I regrettably, I did not see the musical, mm. um, uh, but it's like 511 pages. The that book is 511 pages, not the musical. Yeah, not the musical. Not 511 pages. <laughs> That's what yeah, yeah, the musical is 511 pages <laughs> of only libretto. Yeah. There's no music, which is weird. Yeah. Um, what was your process like with with Michael with adapting that that book? Um, it was it was uh, it was wonderful and very difficult and lengthy and bizarre. I mean, I. I had only written one musical before that, and actually, the uh, the one that we worked on together, Nobody Loves You, and actually, I started 
did Fortress and Nobody Loves You whatever time. So they were sort of first two experiences writing a musical. Um, I, I will say this, the next time someone adapt, uh, asked me to adapt a novel into a musical, I will think about it very, very carefully before saying yes, because it is a deceptively different form from theater. Um, theater, theater is much closer to music to begin with. Um, you know, something being performed live and language has a music to it. Novels are all about subjective experience, being inside someone's head. Music can get you there, but, um, but it's really different. And the, den you know, the density of it and the flow of it and the number of events, um, it was really challenging. And it's a big, dense book. Michael's score is extraordinary. Um, I mean, for people who don't know the book, it's about two boys growing up in Brooklyn in the 70s, one white and one black, who are friends, just as the neighborhood that they're in begins to sort of gentrify. And so we watch them through childhood as their lives diverge. And then the second half of the book tracks a white kid who's grown up to be a music journalist who comes back to Brooklyn to contend with what he left behind generally and what's happened to his friend, who is the son of a sort of a, a formerly famous 70s soul singer uh, who's then sort of like fell out of favor um, and as an adult the the journalist has written you know released a box set of his friend's father's music while no longer really being in touch with this friend who's now in prison so it's a really kind of sad complicated story about race and class and art uh, in America from like the 70s to the 2000s um, and, uh, and so what Michael did uh, was, his approach was, uh, what we want to do is, is a jukebox musical of songs that never really existed. So he wrote all of these soul and punk and R&B songs that sound like they're songs of the eras, early hip hop, the eras that the show is moving through. Um, and, uh, but they're actually sort of invented to comment thematically on what's happening in the story. So he was just kind of generating this score. And then we were weaving it together with my attempt to turn the novel into a series of discrete events that sort of hit each other like dominoes the way you need to do. And I mean, one, I mean, this is glib, but one answer to how did we do it is we did it. I think it's a, I think it's a, yeah. I, think, I think it's a, uh, I think it's, I, Daniel Aachen, who directed it and sort of the whole thing was his idea, would say very wisely and probably truly that certain stories are so difficult to tell that you can only tell them through scripts or like through librettos that are somehow broken and don't work. Like if you tried to make something that worked, it would be too clean and fail to tell the story that you're trying to tell. Right. I think it's a very forgiving point of view. I think <laughs> we were trying to do something impossible and, um, and it's a very ungainly, piece but um i think i think the parts where it works it's probably the most powerful thing i've ever worked on mm -hmm. there's some elemental power in the novel and then that's translated into michael's music and then my job was just to like try to create a scaffolding to contain all of that right um so it was a really long process and we it took us like six years from when we first started it to through workshops to doing the premiere and which was in dallas in like 2014 and then and then going to the public uh -huh. um uh so uh it, it it was that was that was the process yeah. Yeah. Was, and and after that band's visit which was already a script you know it was a movie but at least it was in dramatic form it was like i remember reading i don't know if there's any baseball fans on the call but i remember meeting that reading that willie mays used to spend the off season wearing soupy like lead shoes so that when he started the season and switched to his normal cleats, he would feel really oh, fast nice. and his feet would feel really light. That's what going from Fortress of Solitude to Band's oh. Visit was like as an adaptation. Oh. Like to not have 500 pages of dense prose <laughs> to wrestle with was like much, much easier. Yeah. You know, I, I did some research over the weekend and uh, I read that you, when you were younger, you wanted to write fantasy novels. Sure, I probably still do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you do it all, so I say you hit on that right now during the quarantine. Um, when when did you want to start writing plays? Um, it's a good question. I so fantasy like the first books I fell in love with when I was like nine or ten years old, um, and so when my the ambition to the idea of being a writer first occurred to me, 
I wanted to write the kinds of things I was reading. So yeah, when I was 10 or 11, I was it's like, this is what I'll do, I'll write fantasy trilogies, like the ones that I love. Um, and then I started to get more interested in theater in high school reasons. The first thing that happened was that um, there were a couple of people, at, I went to Berkeley High, I'm from Berkeley, California, and Berkeley High School is this like crazy, diverse, like bizarre place to go to school. And like the artsy, weird, outsider artsy kids at Berkeley High are very outsider and weird and artsy. And there were these guys who were like two, three years older than me, like they were the juniors and seniors when I, were, when I was a freshman. Uh, one of whom was Gabby Alter, who I ended up writing Nobody Loves You With years later. And they were already like writing plays and writing musicals and putting them on in this little black box theater under a pizza place in Berkeley. And, uh, you know, and then after they graduated, they'd come back and do it in the summers. Um, so I would go see musicals that these guys were, these older guys were doing. And it just seemed really cool to me. I was like, oh, like theater can be cool. Like it can be like this cool thing, funny and smart and this cool thing you're doing. And then this was also um, 93, 94, 95. That was when I was in high school. And so in 94, 95, this was after Angels in America had been on Broadway and it was going back around the country. And ACT, which is the big regional theater in San Francisco, did a production of both parts of Angels in America my senior year of high school. So I'd already sort of been thinking about theater and then I went to see that and I started writing my first play the next day. Um, and it was a really bad play about like a senior in high school hanging out with his friends because that was the only life experience I had at that point. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that was what got me started. And then, in, and then in college, theater sort of became my main extracurricular activity. I just loved being in plays and writing yeah. plays as an undergraduate. Uh, and so yeah, I'm a little older than you, but Angels in America seem to have had that effect on all of us. Yeah, there's, we're part of the, the same, it's, yeah, I, I have this, it's, it's like, it's like the, it's like how old you were when Return of the Jedi came out and like whether you hate the Ewoks or not, like if you were young enough, you don't hate the Ewoks. There's a similar bracket that's like, if you were between these ages when Angels in America happened, it's the reason yeah. you entered the war. I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Like, write that down. <laughs> um, I, I don't know who this quote belongs to. I used to think it was Auden, but then I saw yeah, that yeah. this art is never finished, only abandoned. Yeah, so Auden and then Paul Valéry are the two people it's variously credited. I, I, but I told you, I, I'm i going to credit it to you. Right. I dare anyone yeah. to contest me. Yeah. Um, I, that is the kind of writer I, I think of you as in, in this relentless, like beautifully relentless way. And, and not, unless you hit it, not, not defensive. Like we're gonna serve, we're gonna serve the peace. And, and I know what I will say, what I will explore and then say, this is what I believe to be true, mm. right? That, that, is, that is who you are as a writer. And I, my question is of this incredible um, breadth of work that you have, um, what what's the what's the play that you want to have another crack at or a musical uh, that you get to have another crack at? Which ones don't I? Your question, but but you know there's a few uh, uh, there's a few like a lot of my short plays I feel like I hit the target and a couple of my full length plays. Um, you know, recently uh, uh, I, I I I had my last play, my last straight play in New York, which is now almost nine like nine years ago. Um, there's a play called Completeness at uh, Playwrights Horizons, which is a, a romantic comedy about science nerds. Um, and uh, I, I didn't feel like that play was done for like six or seven more years because I could tell, like it, I, I felt like the first half of it worked beautifully and the ending worked. And then there was, there was something I hadn't solved about the late middle, which it, on some level is the hardest part of any script for some reason. So there's a, I could go on a whole tangent about why that is, but I won't right now. But um, but uh, yeah, and just every time someone would do a regional production of Completeness and I could go see it, I would. And finally, after years, um, I, I cracked it. And we just did a production in Philly like a year and a half ago where, where I felt like, oh, the script is done. I actually asked Sam French to republish it. Um, and it's just a gut feeling. I don't think about that. I don't think the play is perfect, but like there's some threshold of rightness right. that until something has crossed it. Um, so that's one example, although that's, I've put that to bed now. I mean, Nobody Loves You, the one we worked on together, 
you know, Gabby and I didn't really feel like that was done um, when it was off Broadway. And then um, we didn't get another chance to work on it for a while. And we, actually, I mean, we just did it in Atlanta a couple of years ago yeah. at, at Horizon yeah. Theater. And when they did it, we they were like, and they just sort of knew it was this thing that was out there and they wanted to do it. And we said, if you do it, can we come and work on it? And they were like, of oh, course. So, yeah. so we did, yeah. we did a whole bunch of rewrites for them and we feel like we got it a lot closer. Yeah. We're actually looking for, for new commercial producers for it now. We were just sort of on the brink of maybe starting to get it going again. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. But um, but uh, hopefully meaning everything is just delayed, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and that it will come back. But so so that's another one. I mean, you learn, you know, you learn as you go yeah. and decisions, creative decisions you made or things you were attached to earlier on, um, you're able to let go of, you're able to see, you're able to see the solution. Um, it's interesting. I wrote, I mean, I wrote a piece for American Theater Magazine last year about my struggle to rewrite completeness over the years. And what I said in that piece and what I think is true is that it's not a coincidence that I finally saw how to fix completeness only after I had done the first workshop of my next yeah. play. That like while completeness was still my last play, I couldn't see how to fix it because this, maybe this is just me um, or uh, maybe it's not everyone but includes me. Um, when something is my last piece of work, there's some existential feeling around it, like maybe this will be the last thing I ever write. And it puts this pressure on it for it to be everything or say everything. Right. And once they had enough, just it was the first draft, so it was just finding itself. Suddenly, completeness was like a closed system in a way it hadn't been before inside of me. And I was like, oh, well, all this play needs to say is X, Y, and Z. And I'm almost there and I don't need to, I can throw this out. And, you know, it's so, so it's sort of, it's some recursive process of like, don't get stuck on one thing forever, keep going. But that doesn't mean you're not allowed to circle back when the dust clears. Well, and you know? a lot of that dust too, right, is, are all the voices. I mean, mm. because with every project, I mean, the project we worked on, there was a, there was a nonprofit involved and all of those folks and there was yeah. You know, you still had, you'd come from the old globe where probably you had some lingering ideas from that production or things that were put in yeah. your mind as far as, hey, I think you should work on this. So I think like the dust clearing is, is your dust, but it's also allowing um, the new approach by way of a new yeah. team, fresh perspective, yeah. all of that. Um, I'm not going to ask you that question. Oh, right? no. <laughs> Well, I don't. I, we got. We got. We we already have some hands up, so I, I want to make good use of our time. I um. I always like to ask people this because I think it's useful for all of us, no matter where we are in our careers, to hear how we came to our first professional production of mm. anything. So you went to Yale, yeah. and then you started applying for grad school out of. Yeah. Yale. Well, it might be helpful for people to hear. Uh, I applied to grad school my, my senior year of college and was rejected. I only applied to one school, which was not a good idea, uh, <laughs> which was NYU, incidentally, and then I didn't get in that year. And then the next fall, I wrote a new play um, and applied to a whole bunch of places uh, and ended up uh, uh, getting in and, and, and went to NYU. And, um, and so I, I, my first year out of school, I just lived in New York and was a theater intern and then an office temp for a year. And yeah, then I did a couple of years in the MFA program at NYU. And my first professional productions um, happened for a couple of reasons. The, the first is that, you know, the, there's this thing, the dramatist source book that has all of the theaters. And, and so I was sort of early on at that time, I was, I had like two plays, maybe one and a half plays, but I was really diligent about sending the plays that I had to every contest okay. for which they were ineligible. And that often led nowhere and, or you'd be a quarter finalist for this and then maybe you win something and here's, you know, $500, which is not nothing, even psychologically, it's hugely important for anybody. Paid for your work. Yeah. yeah. Or just like, we liked it, you know, anything other than total rejection is nice. Right. Um, and then one of those led to my first professional production. I won something from uh, this company in Bloomington, Indiana called the Bloomington Playwrights Project. And uh, the prize was they do the play. So, um, so that was an early production of my play, Outrage, 
in Bloomington. This is probably like 2000 maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, 2001 maybe. And, um, and so that was the first one was just winning that contest. And then, and then, but more frequently the early ones came from, I didn't have an agent back then, but it came from taking advantage of the fact that theater is full of um, non-competitive collaborators. Like other playwrights might feel competitive with you and you might feel competitive with them, but there's directors, there's actors, there's, there's designers, there's all of these people whose success is interdependent with yours, not in competition. Right. With so my early productions mostly came out of, you know, doing readings uh, in New York with friends who knew actors and they would cast those actors. And then the actor would be like, I know a guy at this theater who's looking for a play like this. And, you know, just sort of like the telephone game right. of doing the work in whatever self-generated way I could. And then it leading to this person passes it to this person and... You know, so uh, the first production of Bach at Leipzig was at the Hangar in Ithaca. And it happened because I'd been doing readings of it at NYU, of the scenes as I was writing them. And one of the actors in one of those readings, like gave it to Kevin Moriarty, who at the time was, the, was running the Hangar. Later, he took over Dallas Theater Center which, and premiered Fortress there. So like, it's all about relationships, I guess it, is what I'm saying. It really is. Yeah, so, so that was how it started. And so by the time I, you know, people think, oh, I'm out of school, let me get an agent and the agent will get me productions. Agents sometimes get you productions. More often they just negotiate a contract once it's happened, you know? And I say that as someone who has a fairly aggressive agent, but like at, the, at best, you, agents work like a matching grant. They, they work as much for you as you're working for them. Seriously. The harder you're working for yourself, actually, the harder your agent will work for you. That's, that's yeah. what I've learned. That's yeah. really well put. Um, I'm going to open up to questions here. Uh, some, sometimes the questions will trickle in and then they'll start to build and I don't want to take up all <laughs> day here. Um, we'll do like a speed round, do a lightning round. I'll just yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and yeah. And then we'll repeat them. Yeah. See who knows the, the answer. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that someone uh, sent in to me over email, Courtney Collins, who is this fabulous um, actress here in town. Uh, she was in the prom, actually. Oh, cool. For some reason, she's being shy and she's not asking her question over the uh, microphone. So it's a little, it's a love letter, I want to call it. Um, hi, Itamar. I love the band's visit. I went by myself. And this is beautiful. I went by myself and I sat next to a stranger. We wept together, shared Kleenex, laughed, clapped, and swayed with the seductive rhythms and melodies. We hugged goodbye after the show was over, having shared a beautiful theatrical experience together. So I want to thank you for that first. You've had wonderful success writing plays, musicals, and TV film scripts, all quite different mediums for telling stories. As a writer, how do you... How, forgive me, how did you have to adapt to each medium? Or what are some things you've discovered are different for writing for musical theater versus theater? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, the, I have two opposite answers, which is one is that they're very different and one is that they're exactly the same. Um, the, uh, this actually occurred to me during one of the questions Amanda was asking, earlier that like when you have all the voices that you're listening to my, generally my 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 response with notes is to to nod thoughtfully at all of them and then go off and do whatever i was planning to do anyway and then some of them will happen to address the notes and people are like oh good you took our note so that's the general principle but early on yeah you remember that but early on when i was writing musicals um because i was newer to them uh i i i, I went away from my own instincts in a number of places because um, I was convinced, uh, both by people saying it and by my own just assumptions, mm -hmm. oh, well, in a play, that's how I would do it. In a musical, you have to do it like this. And actually, on the deepest level, your instinct, your craft instinct about what will engage the audience is the same. There are no, there are no rules in musicals any more than there are in plays. Like, does it have to start with a song? Does it have to not start with a song? Does it have to start with a group number? Does it have to start with a solo? Like, the answer is it has to start with whatever works for your show. Mm -hmm. Van's visit starts with, there's no, a brief overture, but then it starts with a long-ish scene with no music in it at all. And the opening number, such as it is, opens scene two. 
and no one would teach you that as a formal approach in grad school, but it's what works for that show. So, so, so there's a deep level on which every show, play and musical, is unique, and you just have to learn from the show what it wants to be and then allow it to be that. Um, on, a, on a more surface level, they're, they're very different forms. And uh, um, my instinct in plays is to, I mean, this is gonna be funny to anyone who knows what a wordy writer I actually am uh, in, in a certain way, um, but you're, you, the most important or bald-faced statements of theme or the point of your play are the exact things you never want anyone to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a musical, once you get into lyrics, um, you kind of want to say those things. You maybe want to say them poetically uh, and you want them to scan and rhyme <laughs> and like land on the right part of the music. But like the very thing that people can't say in speech, they can say in song. Yeah. So, so in terms of what, um, so, so there's something, again, like all these rules are dangerous if you adhere to them too much, but there's something about taking what is subtext in a play and making it sung text in, in a musical um, that's one difference. Uh, also just, I don't write music. I've written lyrics or co-written lyrics on some things I've worked on. Um, not even always that, but, it's, but if I'm not writing lyrics, which on Bands Visit I wasn't, it's, you just need to have the sort of, you know, egoless team player attitude that allows you to take all of the emotional peaks of the story and turn them over to somebody else to execute. Uh, in Bands Visit, again, because it's so unusual that even that's not true. They're, they're like, emotional explosions that happen purely in book, which musicals um, uh, often don't allow. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, uh, so I don't, I don't know. And then I don't know if you, I don't think you asked about television, but that's a whole other ball game because especially the one television I've done where I'm staffing on someone's show and you're, that's, you're a team player. You're all writing in this world and with these characters, somebody else created and your job is to be like a soldier in that army. And that can be satisfying in a different way. But, um, uh, but yeah, no, f formally, musicals are harder too. That's the other difference. Music, I've, I've written, I've tried to write fiction. I've written TV, I've written screenplays, I've written plays. Musical is the hardest form I've ever worked in by far because they're, and that's just because of the marriage of the elements. Um, they're really hard to get right uh, because it's, you're jamming together these things that actually don't go together very easily. Right. And, um, once the machinery is up and running, it's way harder to change things. If I see something I wanna change in a play that we're in previews for, um, I'll bring in the new draft of scene five tomorrow and we'll rehearse it and put it up on stage that, that night. Right. If I wanna change a book scene in a musical, I'm gonna get told we have 30 minutes to rehearse that next Tuesday because the next three days we're redoing this number and we have to redo the choreography and there's, so it's just, like making changes to a musical in previews is like, is like trying to, I don't know what the metaphor is. It's like, it's like a merry-go-round and you're trying to like toss a kid onto the merry-go-round. <laughs> there's one open horse and you have to wait for it to come around. And then you're like, I better not miss. And then if you do, <laughs> you say. yeah, and then if you do, yeah. so, so those are, yeah, those are some of the differences. Well, and there was a piece of the question, um, and this was something I had wanted to talk about as well, uh, with, with TV and film scripts and as opposed to just writing to the theater. And right. if, if I may, I'm gonna sort of tag on to the piece of Courtney's question, which is, I, I have always personally been stumped when you're writing for television, and I, I know this would be the showrunner's job, I suppose, to have this vision, but I, with writing and not knowing what the end game is, mm. writing inside sort of the nebulousness of will you be picked up again and where is this story going right is that as challenging as it seems to be in my brain i mean yes and no i've i've worked on like four or five shows at this point they've all been pretty serialized as opposed to like self-contained episodes uh -huh. they've all been like a season-long story and you're generally thinking season to season mm -hmm. so you you might not know if you're getting another season after that sometimes you do um but you all work the way it works is i uh one of my showrunners said that it was like you're, you're mapping a road trip and when you start talking about it, okay, we're gonna do season two now. 
Um, you, all you know is you're starting in New York and you're ending in LA and you want to stop in Topeka, Kansas halfway through. And that's all you know. And then you spend the next three or four months mapping the route like city by city. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. So mm -hmm. usually you, you, it's, it's all of you around a table, however many writers there are, outlining the season together in some, in some detail and then dividing that up into episodes. And then maybe at some point, okay, we've got the first five, we've got the first six, everybody goes off to write scripts for two weeks. And you come back and you have the first half of the season scripted, and then you break the second half of the season while the network reads the first half of the scripts and tells you what's wrong mm -hmm. with them. And then, you, go, you know, so, so you know, when I write episode three, the script for episode two doesn't exist yet, but an outline does. So I know how episode two is supposed to end, and I know how episode four is supposed to start. So I, I'm, and I know what the outline of episode three is. Yeah. So that's, so it, it's very possible to do it. It feels very safe actually. And then as those things change, the ripples sort of go in all directions. I have, I have twice had the experience of working on a season of a show where we didn't know it was the last season and then the show got canceled and we had set up all these stories for the following season that then we, <laughs> then we never got to tell. Yeah. What show was that? Uh, it happened twice. I, I worked on Men of a Certain Age, which was um, Ray Romano and Andre Brower and Scott Bakula as like three friends in their 50s dealing with the long shadow of mortality as it begins yeah. to. Uh, and it was a beautiful show, very odd and weird with a small devoted following. And uh, I worked on season two of that show and we had a whole set of arcs we were setting up for season three and then TNT canceled it after season two. Um, and, uh, and then it happened again. I worked on a show called Outsiders uh, mm -hmm. about a clan of Appalachian mountain people who lived on this mountain in, in, in Kentucky and a coal company wants to kick them off the mountain. And there's a town caught in between that's like, we respect the people on the mountain, but we also need jobs. So we kind of need the coal company. And it was about that triangle. David Morse was like the leader of the the family yeah. and I worked on season two of that show and we were setting up a season three and then the network got sold to some other corporation and they canceled all the original programming so yeah <laughs> so that can happen and does yeah. happen frequently yes yeah sometimes shows are suspended because of pandemic. exactly um so I'm going to turn to a couple of live questions Amy Please. has a question hi can you hear hi me? Awesome, thank you so much for your time. I have uh, kind of a two part question. So the first one is what are your favorite ways actors engage with your scripts or can you offer examples of that? And then the next one is, could you talk about your ideal working relationship with a composer? Those are very good questions. Um, so uh, actors, smart actors are a huge gift to a writer because you are, I'm looking at the play, like I'm looking at this bird's eye view of this map, but an actor uh, is just trying to drive their car along the one road you've given them, which is the arc of their character. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a pothole in that road, they're gonna let you know. Um, so, uh, so I like, uh, I like when actors try to execute what I've written and then in a way that's sort of, you know, it also helps once you have trust. I like to work with, I think this is why a lot of writers like to work with the same actors again and again, because you're like, okay, I know, like there's certain actors, like I know, you know, she's amazing. And I know when she can't get, she, when she can't make sense of the scene, there's something, there's a lie in it. There's something I've done wrong. And you sort of have to develop that trust. But uh, uh, so I like it when actors try to execute what's there, like really try. Um, but then also we'll, we'll sort of engage, ask questions and engage in a conversation about like, okay, well, what are you going for here? Um, oh, well, I, okay, so here's the reason I can't get there. Like, I don't know enough about, you know, um, and every actor is different. They have, you know, people have different approaches. So it's all about learning each other. But um, uh, yeah, it, it can, it's, it's a problem when someone has their own idea about what it should be that isn't sort of suggested by the play and is, creating a problem because they're trying to impose something and it's a problem it's also a problem when someone you know i'll just make this work you know using actor tricks 
Um, although actors <laughs> end up in a position where they have to do that because the writer won't change anything. So uh, it's a two-way street. But uh, so yeah, I like I I, I like it when um, they're really trying to sort of honor that journey, and then they'll they'll have a conversation with you in a way that's productive about like here's why I can't get there, um, and uh, uh, and then you know a, a relationship with the composer. It's like it really is like any relationship. Like you, um, they're all different. I don't know that I have an ideal one. I think it depends on the material, uh, um, all three of the musicals I've written that have been produced, the relationship could not have been more different. You know, Gabi and Alter, Gabi Alter and I write songs together. We do the lyrics together and he does the music. And we've been friends since we were kids. So our relationship is very like, we'll just hang out, you know, in one of our apartments and just like crack each other up. And like, I don't know, we just work together in the same room really well. Um, with, with Michael Friedman, it was sort of the opposite. He was such, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was such a sort of force of nature as a person. I never was in the room with him while he was writing music. Like he would just deliver these like, okay, here's this new, like, and, and it was sort of about each of us working separately and then often in the room with actors, like weaving it together. And that was the only way it could have worked with Michael, it would not have been helpful for him for me to be there while he was writing music um, and be like, well, what about, you know, um, that's just not how his brain worked. And, uh, and then Yazbek was kind of in between. Um, you know, I wrote the first draft of Band's Visit just as a script with no songs. And then he and I sat down with that script and circled what we thought all the song moments were. And then he went off and tried to write them. And sometimes he'd be like, perfect, it worked. And sometimes he'd be like, it doesn't work, there's no song there. And sometimes he'd be like, there could be a song there, but I'm struggling with what it says. Why don't, can you write a monologue for the character? It can be a terrible monologue, but write a monologue about what it would be if it was a speech and send me the monologue. And then I do that. And then he would cannibalize that and write the song. So the, I, I, I wish I had a more helpful answer, but it really is about, um, it's a combination of how you work best with that person and how you work and how, how to best serve the material that you're trying to create, I guess. Like I, um, so I, I wouldn't say that I have an ideal relationship. My ideal relationship is the one that best serves the piece yeah. that you're trying to write. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> uh, Lauren has a question. Hey, Lauren. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I actually just want to share a story because. Uh, I wanted to hear more about the device of the different languages in the band's visit, and then you talked about that so beautifully. But the reason it meant so much to me was that I happened to see that show when I was in New York at the director's lab, and so I saw it with this cohort of people from all over the world, many of whom spoke Arabic and Hebrew, and all of whom who weren't American, who had been in New York, attempting to communicate about art in a second language, which I just found astounding and admirable. And it so happens that earlier that week, we had seen My Fair Lady, mm -hmm. which was sort of this garish celebration of the English language as the most perfect thing. And I sat in that show and was kind of horrified, like, oh gosh, okay. Um, yeah, they're all sitting here and trying to speak English and being told that maybe they're, the way they speak English is not so great. And then a few days later, we got to go see the band's visit. And for the first time, they understood everything. And I was the one who had to sit and put things together in context because they were fluent in all of the languages on stage. And I just... It was a very powerful show. It's a beautiful piece. And it was a powerful way to experience the piece. And it created this sense of equality and unity amongst us. Um, so that device was incredibly effective and moving to me. And I just wanted to thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you for saying so. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Amy has another question. Or, no, sorry, another, there, it's another Amy, forgive me. <laughs> I really need to strengthen my glasses, Amy. Sorry about that. Hi. No, all good. All good. 
Um, so first off, wanted to say hello from Horizon because I'm on staff there and Hi. wanted to do a quick wave from uh, Lisa and everybody over there. Hi, um, Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> um, second, uh, my question is about uh, writing the band's visit and personal identity with that and if that was something that kind of resonated, especially because I, I saw it in New York. I'm Jewish. I flew up to see it. It was very important to me. I was like, this is something that needs to be seen um, by people in that community um, and whether or not those kinds of, you know, as you were writing it, if personal identity kind of pinged in the moments where those connections were made between the cultures or if there were moments that pinged like that when you were writing? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I think the first, the first relevant answer is that I think it's why my, my parents are Israeli immigrants. I'm from California, but my parents uh, both were born in Israel. Um, my mom grew up there, my dad less so. It's sort of a peripatetic European childhood. Um, but I do have Israeli relatives I've visited many times. So that aspect of my identity, I think initially felt like, oh, okay, I might, I see why they want to hire. They now claim, Oren now claims that the fact that I was Israeli American had nothing to do with why they tried to hire me. Um, at the time, though, I was like, oh, I'm sure this is why they're talking to me about it. And I, that makes some sense. Like, it answers the why me question in some way. And maybe I feel, okay, I have some, I have these voices in my head. I've been to the region. Um, it gives me some sense of uh, authority over the material. So, so that definitely, especially, and this is, you know, 2013, 2014, theater was just starting to have um, conversations that keep growing about representation, uh, who should be in what story, who has the right to tell what story. And I was like, well, this definitely answers that question. No one's going to be like, why'd they hire that guy? Um, so that was my first answer. But if you know my body of work from before that, my Israeli identity has come into it almost not at all. Mm -hmm. I think there's like a Jewishness to some of my characters, but they're for the most part not explicitly Jewish. I wrote a play called Yellow Jackets about my high school in which the character based on me is the child of Israeli immigrants because that plays very much about um, ethnicity and class and stuff like that at Berkeley High, so it was relevant. But I, I avoided it mostly, and I didn't think I was avoiding it for any particular reason. And working on this show cracked this door open for me that has started to have an effect on my work going forward. So Band's Visit was Band's Visit, like I was adapting Iran's movie. I didn't have to bring my identity to bear so much in generating material, because even the new material I generated for the script was an outgrowth of all the stuff he'd set up. But, um, but it did crack open the door for me and uh, the stuff I've worked on more recently kind of embraces the specifics of my identity more. And as I think about why I avoided it before, on some level, I just didn't want to be pigeonholed as this or that kind of writer. But I think it also has to do with like, um, what the culture allows to be the default voice, you know, the straight white male voice being some kind of default and allowing you to write, oh, this is universal, it's not specific, you know, when in fact every identity is as niche and specific as every other identity, that's the point. Um, and so I, I think working on Band's Visit was a useful half step for me because it was someone else's vision right. to then leave me in a place where now I feel um, like I'm able to write more fully out of my own identity. So I think the effect is, is more a knock on effect um, of the work I'm going to do going forward. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Amy. Um, we're right at three, but if I may, I'd like to ask you a, a final question. It's something Great. we haven't, we haven't talked about and it's something we're all still dealing with. Um, a lot of the, actors and, and directors and designers um, who are on this call right now, their, their work was um, ceased and halted when all the theaters shut down here. And I think I'd love to hear what all of us are do, doing during this time. And as a, as a writer, you know, I wrote this to you, Itamar, I, I'm not naive and I, I do understand that it's not like, oh, look, I've got all this time to sit in my home and write the next play of mine. I know it doesn't work that way. And, and a lot of people do better actually with some rigidity in their schedule and in their calendar. Um, so I just wondered if you could share with us how you're spending your time as it applies to your work. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's 
in a very slow motion, having a gradually positive effect on my relationship to my work. I mm -hmm. think I, I haven't been hugely productive, but I haven't been completely unproductive either. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it is difficult to have a life um, where you're generating your own structure and you have to do all kinds of things to make that work. Mm -hmm. And so you develop a structure that mimics, you know, uh, I've, I've had very few day jobs in my life. I've had some, especially if you include, you know, like writing jobs, uh, like TV writing jobs, but those are, you know, three month, four month gigs. Um, and, uh, and so I think the, the structure I'm always trying to mimic is school. <laughs> like, like get up in the morning and like walk to the cafe and then set up and it's like, you know, and that's like mimicking going to school in the morning and then come home, you know, uh, I can't do that now. And so that it was, a, I was like, oh, this isn't changing my life at all. But actually having to get up and start writing in my apartment without leaving and going through some membrane to another place. Yeah. Um, and then saying, well, what if writing isn't the first thing I do in the morning? What if I, you know, allow my day to have a more fluid shape and I genuinely just write when I feel inspired and then try not to panic or be in control of when I am inspired, just focus on being present and like living my life and trusting that inspiration will come as a byproduct of that. All the stuff that it tells you in the artist's way or whatever, like whatever, you know, <laughs> methods. Well, I love the artist's way. Great, right? It's a, it's a great book. Um, but yeah, and it's, and it's a, you know, and it's a practice. And so this has been, there's some things that are deeply uncomfortable about this. Leaving, even leaving aside the logistical, you know, terror of what's going to happen to theater as a business or film and TV production as a business. It's all shut down right now. How do those things come back? In what way do they, will there be a cycle of, sh of shutdowns? Like, we don't know what places will survive. Even leaving all of that aside, just psychologically, um, what am I, you know, what am I writing about? Who am I writing for? What's important to say now? Is it different than what was important to say six months ago? Mm -hmm. um, and so by necessity, I can't answer that. Like, I'm, I'm not forcing myself to answer those questions right now because it's impossible. And so very, very slowly, I think I'm, uh, hopefully I'm building a muscle that will continue to serve me on the other side of this, where I'll be, let, I'll be putting less pressure on myself in general to be productive, which will lead to more satisfying productivity you know, or I won't feel like I have to do this or that thing. I have to be, I have to do my writing first thing in the morning. I have to be, go to a cafe. Like all the have tos have fallen away because I can't. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and so, and, and then, you know, I'm, in terms of what I'm writing practically, I'm, you know, this, this or that, a couple, you know, there's a number of projects I was already committed to. And so I'm trying to keep going with those, either, you know, incorporating, thematic things that I'm newly thinking about, realizing that I was already writing about these themes because this pandemic has just exposed things that were already true about our world, um, or using it purely as an escape and writing about a world either before this or after it's over. Um, but I don't think anyone should beat themselves up for not being productive right now. Um, yeah. I, I saw one more hand go up and I apologize, it's 307. Are you cool with one more? Yeah, hand? I could do one more. Okay, Sarah <laughs> has a question. Hi there, uh, thanks so much for taking my question and for being here. This is Sarah Nathanson. Yeah. I don't know if you remember me, I was a core company member at the Orchard Project. When I remember, were... yes. I was like, I know that name. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing? Um, right. I love the band's visit so much. I find its use of stillness and slowness really refreshing and I'm so curious firstly what your language background is mm. and secondly as actors in the show don't always speak Arabic or Hebrew how did you write the non-English lines is it yeah. English transliteration is it some combination were there other actors who spoke the languages who were helping construct that yeah uh so my own language background is uh I kind of understand Hebrew. My parents spoke it in the house growing up and I have like a deep brain memory of Hebrew. Like if I go to Israel and I'm there for two or three weeks, I start to come up with phrases I didn't know I knew. Mm -hmm. That's my knowledge of Hebrew. I don't speak it very well, but I can understand it okay and get a lot from context. I don't know Arabic at all. Um, and um, 
I think my relevant skill is less for it's less knowing a lot of languages and more having an ear, a, almost a musical ear for the rhythms of speech. And uh, so in terms of how we did it, technically, um, we had a Hebrew translator uh, who translated the Hebrew. We had an Arabic translator um, for the Atlantic production who was sort of a classical um, Arabic scholar. And so the Arabic in the off-Broadway production was actually quite different from the Arabic we had on Broadway. It was, it was kind of a, a classical Arabic that no one actually speaks now and certainly isn't specific to Egypt or Alexandria. And that was adjusted by a, a, a new translator um, when we went to Broadway to make it like, no, this is what these guys would actually say in Arabic. And then the Hebrew was also further refined. We had a bunch of native Hebrew speakers in the cast uh, in a few roles. And so uh, they helped a lot. You know, and, and then I would work with them because they would say like, okay, there's two or three ways of saying this. And I would pick the one that sounded musically right to me. Like I wanted, um, I always tended towards Hebrew words that were Hebraizations of English words. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I thought whenever that could happen, that was helpful. Um, but things like, you know, uh, there's the scene in the park where the female protagonist's sometime lover follows her from this restaurant where she's run into him and starts yelling at her and the two of them have this half page long fight entirely in Hebrew and um, Jonathan Raviv the actor who played the guy uh, is Israeli and so he just improvised the fight and uh, and then I would be like okay I like that I like how that sounds I like how that sounds and um, and then we together crafted it into what ended up in the script and then um, and then yeah the, the our Arabic translator um, uh, helped with the, uh, there's like an official way you transliterate Arab and Arab and she sort of helped me um, uh, with the right way to depict that for actors and Hebrew transliteration I can kind of do. Um, so I sort of did it and then, and then some of the actors helped me adjust it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, nice to hear from you. And Amara, thank you for your time. Thank you, that was a pleasure. This really was a pleasure and thanks uh, to all of you for joining us today. This was a really great hour. I always feel so energized after these phone calls. I'm going to try to capsize on that. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your time and we'll see you soon. Hopefully. It's great to see you. Thanks, everybody. Okay.